afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Samantha Shokin, Manager of Public Programming here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to say a few words about the museum. The Museum of Jewish Heritage is the leading New York institution dedicated to fighting anti-Semitism and bigotry using our exhibitions, programming, and educational resources for schools. We are proud to have welcomed more than two million visitors to the museum, trained thousands of teachers, and educated hundreds of thousands of students. In engaging with history, people of all ages and backgrounds inherit our mission to never forget. If you're interested in receiving information about upcoming programs, exhibitions, and special offers, please join our mailing list. A sign-up sheet is on the table to my left. I also invite you to become a member and join the museum's vibrant community. Membership brochures can also be found on the table. We are delighted to co-present today's program with YIVO, our esteemed colleague organization located on West 16th Street. YIVO is dedicated to fostering knowledge of the history and culture of East European Jewry. You can find information about YIVO on the table as well. We are privileged to have historian and photographer Elzbieta Janika with us this afternoon. Dr. Janika, who holds an MA from the University of Paris and a PhD from Warsaw University, investigates Polish participation in the murder of Jews facilitated by the German Nazi state, as well as the underlying cultural patterns and narratives that legitimized such violence and exclusion. Her stunning visual works capture the consequences of the Holocaust on urban topography and non-urban landscapes. Among other projects, Dr. Janica will discuss a photographic project titled Herbarium that she has been pursuing for 15 years within the area of Treblinka II. We are thrilled to have Dr. Jonathan Brent, Executive Director and CEO of YIVO, join Dr. Janica in conversation today. Jonathan is a historian, publisher, translator, writer, and teacher. He was editorial director at Yale University Press, where he established the Annals of Communism series. Jonathan has translated poems of Joseph Brodsky and Vladimir Mayakovsky and teaches history and literature at Bard College. He is currently writing a biographical study of the Russian writer Isaac Babel and finishing a novel. Before we begin, please take a moment to silent your mobile devices to avoid disruptions during the program. Um, Please don't videotape this program. Uh, a recording, a video recording will be available on our YouTube channel uh, next week if you're interested in watching it on our website in addition to all of our other public programs. Thank you. And please join me in welcoming Elspieta, Janika, and Jonathan Brent. Before we get started, I'd like to say a couple of words of further introduction and, and also uh, to express our gratitude, uh, the gratitude of the EVO Institute uh, for uh, the uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage. This is the first co-sponsored uh, partner, partnership program that we have had, and I look forward to many more. It's a very meaningful an important uh, association of, of two very important New York institutions devoted to Jewish memory. Um, and I could say that uh, the work of Elzbieta Janitska is uh, very much uh, uh, devoted to this very question of memory, not just Jewish, but also Polish. Uh, her work that she has pursued painstakingly for many, many years has astounding breadth, incisiveness, depth. But it isn't just the research that she has made. It is the, it is the thinking that is behind it that is of such importance, I think, to discussions today about the relationship of Jews and Poles, both before and during and after the Holocaust and today as well, uh, and the place of Jewish memory in the Polish landscape, uh, which as I think we all in this uh, room today know, 
is, is a very conflicted uh, memory. Um, and so uh, what I would like to do now is simply uh, hand the microphone over to uh, Dr. Yanitska, who will begin um, her presentation. Thank you. Yes, so, but it will be a talk if I understood well. So but I, I will just begin with, uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Jonathan, for having had the idea, and thank you, Samantha, and the Museum of Jewish Heritage for following. Uh, I'm really beyond honored and also very moved to see you so numerous uh, this afternoon uh, in the room. So I will just begin with the general presentation of the place that we, we are used to imagine as an isolated, remote place. And this is how it looks like today. Uh, and um, so but digging, so this is, this is the today's view of, uh, of uh, the uh, German Nazi extermination camp, Treblinka II. Uh, yes, but digging deeper, we realize that this today's view of Treblinka has nothing to do with the actual state of the place at the times, at the time of the, of the Holocaust. Uh, as well as before and after, after it. And um, here you have um, an aerial photography uh, by Luftwaffe of, of the site uh, taken in, uh, in 1944. And you can see that it has nothing of, uh, uh, I mean, isolated. And you can see just the fields, cultivated fields all around the camp. So I investigated uh, very much. I mean, in this in this direction. And here is the, is a picture taken just after the unveiling of the monument. And you also can see that the forest surrounding the the site today was planted only years after the unveiling. Uh, if, I, if I could stop you for just one second, maybe you could say one word as to why this question of the supposed isolation of the camp is, is really important in understanding its meaning. Uh, yes, because we, we tend to um, the isolation question would allow to imagine and place the Holocaust outside somewhere else uh, far from, from us. Uh, whereas it's the opposite that was the case. And um, maybe it's worth, uh, it worth adding uh, a few words about the Holocaust of, of the Polish Jews, of the Jews, of the, of the Poland's Jews. Because we usually associate the Holocaust to Auschwitz. Auschwitz equals the Holocaust. Whereas Auschwitz had little to do with the Holocaust of uh, the Poland's Jews, who, peri who, who were killed uh, in uh, five other places, extermination camps, which were not concentrations, uh, concentration camp, camp at the same time, which Auschwitz was. You have Auschwitz and Birkenau, and this is Birkenau, Auschwitz to Birkenau, which was devoted to the industrial extermination of the European Jews, namely, I mean, mainly European Jews. But it's far from being the core of the question, those five uh, extermination camps, uh, because the Holocaust of the Polish Jews occurred also in the middle of cities and towns, and, and also in the middle of the social fabric. And uh, this I mean, picture is emblematic for what happened. I also, I'm, I'm the, I'm the co-author of, of another photographic project called uh, The Other City, where a friend of mine, Wojciech Wilczek, we um, 
documented uh, the, the area of the former Warsaw Ghetto. And it was a, a very simple work, a basic work, nothing, nothing complicated about it. And it caused a shock because um, the audience saw that the thing occurred in the very city of the capital town. And this is also an emblematic, I mean, fact that the Holocaust occurred at, at the heart of, of, uh, of the social, at the social heart, at the cultural heart, and, uh, and also spatially, I mean, physically speaking, it occurred at the heart of, at the core uh, of Polish uh, society. So, if we, if we read testimonies uh, about Treblinka, we realize uh, how it was tightly connected, economically speaking, to the neighborhood and to the whole country, uh, how people circulated. Uh, so this, this idea really of having a, an exception far from, far from everywhere uh, is, uh, is more than false. I mean, because this imagination protects also the, interest of, the interests of, of the perpetrators. So I think it's important to keep it in, in mind. And there are other aspects of the, of, of the connection between this space and the general population, which uh, became evident, uh, as you point out, uh, immediate, in, in the immediate aftermath of Treblinka when uh, the ashes were being uh, excavated, essentially, by uh, Polish uh, peasants. Yeah? Not only peasants, Not you only know, peasants. because it was a large business organized by people who dwelled in, in, in the cities. But uh, what, uh, about this, this notion of isolation, what's also worth adding is that we, um, we often uh, imagine, um, for instance, the ghettos as isolated places. Whereas in Poland there were 600, get, 600 ghettos and uh, for the most part they were open ghettos, non-fenced non, non spaces. Whereas in uh, every one of, of, uh, of the ghettos, uh, the conditions which reigned there uh, approached humanitarian catastrophe. So it directs our, our uh, reflection uh, towards the context, the Polish context, the local context, the Christian context of the, of the events. So yes, well, um, it, the ashes were, were explored, <laughs> it, it dug, dug up, and uh, it, first of all, um, well, the uh, ashes actually what what it was like, uh, how they how they were removed, how they how uh, the, the the stages whereby uh, this became uh, uh, by which they became manifested on the surface and part of a social process. Uh, yes. First of all, there there were all kind of of remains uh, because. For at first, the bodies of the victims were buried directly in the earth, uh, whereas at the second stage of, of the of the, of the under, industrial extermination, they were burned. I mean, excavated first and uh, exhumated first, and then and then burned, and then uh, shattered and uh, everything you want. So it was more or less on the surface. Uh, it didn't really need to be, you know. But of course, it w these were very deep layers of, of ashes and other r remnants. Uh, so it was uh, explored, or you know, it resembled a, a way of cultivating fields because people did it with, with agrarian tools and instruments. 
Uh, but also there was the whole, I mean, a more industrial approach. Uh, for instance, it uh, often used to be blown up with uh, dynamite uh, or, uh, yes, anyhow, all kind of, all kind, you, 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 you had, you know, uh, individual diggers, you had, you had uh, collective uh, diggers, you had also those soldiers or, or uh, members of the militia who disposed of much, much more sophisticated tools. <coughs> Also used by by farmers, yes. Uh, yes. To fertilize their crops. It was it was the second. I mean the second um, the second case because first of all uh, these ashes was dug up in search of gold of Jewish gold. Then uh, it was also known for its, I mean, ashes were known for their uh, fertilizing uh, skills, properties. Uh, so for instance, uh, what, what I'm talking about uh, refers to all these camps. But in Trebinka, for instance, there was a, a famous fight between, uh, between the dwellers of two uh, small towns who uh, has the right to to trade these ashes and and um, and fertilize also uh, their fields uh, uh, with them? Uh, anyhow, so so the ashes were spread all around the place, which already was going on during the Holocaust uh, due to the wind, or or the way the ashes were were discarded or disposed. So, once again, this notion of, of isolation uh, doesn't work. Uh, um, and why don't you speak a little bit about this process of, this process whereby these ashes really enter into the food supply? Yes, but but it, there is there is uh, just a short remark about the moment I got to Trebinka for the first time, mm -hmm. and but this is connected with this this um, this topic because um, I was impressed by um, by these uh, these accounts these stories and I realized that these ashes were still circulating. In, in, in the water, in, in the air, in, in, um, so we often, you know, when, when you are in Trebinka, you often hear people who arrive and who are very disappointed uh, and who comment upon the site, oh, there is nothing to see. So I was interested by the nothing, uh, how this nothing is, is constructed and had been produced. So I intended to take pictures to document the air above uh, uh, the six uh, German Nazi extermination camps. And this is the picture entitled Treblinka II um, from a series that I entitled The Odd Place. And in this picture, you can everything you can see is um, perpetrated by the Germans. I mean, as well the technical support uh, of the picture, and also what you can see inside. However, the title is Polish and comes from this stamp. This is a stamp with which the great books of uh, students stigmatized as Jews were marked by the administration of the university, the Warsaw University. However, this measure of uh, apartheid existed in all in all uh, university, in all the, all the Polish university before the war. Uh, so it was an official measure. Uh, um, in addition to the, I mean, bottom-up terror, um, terror uh, aimed at uh, at uh, the Jewish students. 
So this is another work of mine, the stamp, uh, and the the inscription on the stamps uh, reads on the stamp reads place in odd numbered benches. So it's the synonym of the bench, benches ghetto, and uh, in in colloquial Polish called very often just odd place or odd places. So where the title of my uh, series comes from. So you mentioned the question of, of food and um, the food question. And curiously, um, I realized just while shopping in my residence, you know, in, my, in the grocery at the corner, that uh, butter, milk, uh, cheese came from these places and um, it impressed me uh, very much. So you have from the left to the right uh, um, the Jedwabne butter, uh, the Jedwabne butter, the Treblinka butter, and the Jedwabne butter once again. Um, uh, and the Trevinka butter is the is the best one. Uh, so um, yes, I put because there is also a short text I mean, a text where I explain my 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 way to to this project and my how also my understanding uh, has changed over has changed over the years of this question and uh, referring to the famous formula of Itzhak Shamir. Uh, I conclude that this is with the Treblinka butter that I bake birthday cakes to the one who fed me with her, her milk. And this is true. Moreover, this is true. So this is the Kosuplatsky butter. Then you have those delicious mushrooms uh, together with the diligent mushroom pickers. Um, in, in the forest of Treblinka, that you can also buy buy all across uh, all across the country. And finally, uh, a line of herbal teas entitled and named a Polish herbarium, Zielnik Polski. And this is where the title of. Uh, my written explanation comes from. I found it very much to the point, and this line of herbal teas is advertised as coming from the purest eastern regions of Poland. So this is how we get really to the to the core of the matter. So you you speak of Poland as a sarcophagus. Yes. Many people think of, many Jewish people think of Poland as a Jewish cemetery, but you, you call it a sarcophagus. Why don't you explain that a little bit? It's not a cemetery, because a cemetery is a place where people are buried. The victims of the Holocaust were not buried. They had no burial, they had no funeral. They were just discarded where, where, they were, where they were killed. And apart from these, uh, these camps, you, you, you have also uh, still, I mean, countless individual places of, of, uh, of burial. I mean, where people were just unearthed uh, without, you know, where, where, they, where they were killed. So this might be, you know, someone you know in the forest in the in the or in private gardens and uh, it's still something uh, i mean to to deal with yes to address and to deal with so poland is not a cemetery but this is a a sarcophagus why because sarcophagus um poland po polish landscape a sarcophagus is something, a device, a symbolic device, which absorbs, absorbs the bodily remnants and um, produces the, 
the image. Yes, this is how the sarcophagus and, 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 and the grave are supposed to work. And in fact, the place where these body remnants remain are the landscape. Yes, they are, they are really every, everywhere, and it was uh, worked through by many, many writers, many also, many di film directors, and um, it's well, very, well, I, I, very well documented, I think. So I, I'm not that original, but in this idea, I mean, I think the idea of uh, the notion of sarcophagus uh, is relevant to, to, this, to this problem. Yeah, you say that um, the danger is not in the landscape, but the landscape is the danger. Yeah? Yes. And it, that has to do with this idea that the, the land itself has absorbed all of these remnants. I mean, it's, it's also the case in the, in the cities or, for instance, in Warsaw, the former Warsaw Ghetto was raised to the ground. There is nothing on, on the surface. Whereas this surface is still perceived as, um, as menacing, as threatening, as, uh, as, uh, as something which requires a preemption, a, a counter, counter action. And uh, to, to, to what extent? Uh, is it, it is it is perceived as a danger? Uh, I could experience by by myself. Um, I think we will we will address our willow willow question. This flows directly into the willow. Yes. So yes. there is a dialogue which a real dialogue which really occurred on the ground. Uh, between, I think, uh, could you could you read it? Because I, I don't want to inflict uh, to inflict uh, uh, this upon 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 the audience. Uh, so between a uh, two cultivated uh, uh, people, uh, a cultural anthropologist, a professor of cultural anthropology, and a library library uh, library, uh, library scientist. And uh, the professor, the lady, was and got shocked while entering the place. So I, I will read this from from your your paper. A dialogue occurred Easter of 2012, April 6th, on the ground between someone for whom it was the first time and someone for whom it was a regular practice to come and stay there for hours, between a woman and a man, between a cultural anthropologist and a library scientist, between a professor and a doctor. For the former, it was the shock of her life. Professor, oh, Willow's here, doctor. Nothing more common than willow trees in Mazovia. A willow is an emblem of the region. Professor, hmm, I expected palms. Dr. Palms, Professor, palms. Doctor, and cedars of Lebanon? Professor, yes. Yes, willows are not endemic here. So I wanted to First, this, this dialogue was reported to me by this, the library scientist and, uh, and uh, uh, I didn't really get the notion of uh, endemic, you know, the word of... So I checked uh, uh, in a dictionary and uh, the first line said, the opposite of uh, cosmopolitan. And uh, you know what are the examples of uh, a cosmo cosmopolitan organism? Uh, so these examples are uh, rats, uh, wandering rats, uh, mice, uh, worm flies, uh, and and so forth. So uh, it was uh, meaningful to me. And uh, why why the willow? Why why the problem? The willow 
is much more than a, a willow tree. It's an, you know, a, an axiosemitic object and an emblem, uh, uh, an identity emblem, a symbol of Polishness, of Polish land. And here you have the cover of Henry Greenberg's book titled Fatherland, where he works through the notion of, uh, of uh, the fatherland. Uh, from which he uh, had been excluded, uh, and he was not the only one. So these are the willows uh, of Treblinka, and uh, by, uh, uh, I mean, photographed by the uh, library scientist, um, and then the willow in question. It looks innocent, but you you you've already understood how how threatening this is in that place. I, I, I want to uh, back up for one second. The the librarian doesn't think there should be will willows. In, no, in the the uh, cultural anthropologist. Uh, there was a conclusion to the dialogue. Uh, there was a conclusion uh, of the dialogue, so a uh, professor said... Uh, oh, yes. Um, so, unable to wrap her mind around it, she, the librarian, no. uh, the, the cultural anthropologist, uh, returned to the issue while having a last look at the place before leaving. Professor, it must be willows from the psalm. A biblical willow. It couldn't, you know, have been. And and uh, the very the very conclusion says around her neck she wore a cross with the crucified on his hand. He wore a kippah. So this is a Polish Jewish dialogue, um, a very typical one. Um, yes. So here you have the willow branch and. Something I found uh, on the ground as well, uh, but this comes from a reef because people are bringing reefs, and uh, so this is not an endemic palm leaf, but a cosmopolitan. But but I, I just want to get back. In in other words, at the core of the conversation is the idea that something doesn't belong here that a traditional Polish symbol does not belong in this place. Yes. And the other way and, around, and the other way of, this place doesn't yes. belong to... And this place does not belong. In other words, it becomes a symbolic place. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and this is where, where the notion of the in-between comes from, that you arrive in a place, you, you, you see trees, you see flowers, <laughs> you see plants, animals, and they are animals, trees, plants, and flowers. But at the same time, they are, you know, those uh, symbolic, those imaginations, so so powerful, and uh, which were, by the way, at the origin of the whole crime. I mean, uh, uh, these are not the facts that occasioned and triggered this crime. But right. So, so the, the I, I think that what you're what you're saying here is that this symbolic place cannot be really incorporated into Polish symbolic in, system in, into the Polish symbolic system and at the same time that it cannot be incorporated into that system it was never excluded from that system in reality in, in, reality, in reality I mean yes and so that there are two things going on at the quite same the time. opposite yes precisely so that the, the what you call the imaginary, the imaginarium, so to speak, is up here, which is the symbolic system of meaning, but down here is the real work that got done. It's, it's the exact opposite, yes. because all, all these I mean, ideas of, uh, uh, of um, how to say, of um, Polish nature, Polish, Polish, Polish animals, Polish milk, and so on, and all this endeavor, this criminal endeavor, um, fueled by the how to say the aspiration to purity, yes, 
the the the, the main aim of uh, of anti-Semitism was to to purificate yes the the universe, and um, so we I mean the perpetrators intended really really to to um, to produce a perfect world. Uh, whereas what we got instead, this is a, a world made out of Jews, in fact. I mean, Polish landscape is made out of Jews. This, this pure, this landscape which, which was supposed to be, to be purged and, and um, rendered proper, I mean, clean, cleaned, yes. Yeah, why don't you speak a little bit about the dangers of purification? and the consequences that are more than just symbolic. Yes, it's, I mean, yes, this is, this is I mean, both. This, this idea of, of purity and purification provoked this, what, what happened, I mean, uh, the crimes, the, the crime that, that was the Holocaust. And um, without this idea, it wouldn't have occurred. And uh, without this idea, it wouldn't uh, have been perceived as a legitimate crime. And, and this was a Nazi idea, um, but not exclusively. Not exclusively, because it be began with you know with the strong nationalism in the 19th century that it was overtook by the Nazis, of course. But they were not not the only ones, uh, and uh, but they elaborated, you know. Particular, I mean, specific concepts and and uh, and the, the whole imaginary. But we started to imagine the nation as natural and the nature as national. So this is why the willow is Polish, um, and and the palm tree is ascribed to those who are not Polish, who can't be Polish, according to the symbolic system, and. Um, so yes, so this idea, this is an idea, a concept, but it worked in practice and it became a powerful tool of an instrument of crime. And, uh, and um, it got as a result its opposite, its, 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 its exact opposition. I mean, you had this idyllic place because Treblinka looks really idyllic. And it's all it's all, it's it's a nature of uh, I mean it's a nature of cultural of, of cu cultural origin yes you you have you, you get the impression of being really in, in the middle of a of a, how to say of an immaculate uh, landscape but this also helps to shed some light on why it is possible to have anti-Semitism without Jews because the Jews are there. I mean, they're not there in the symbolic system, but they're there in the land, in the ground, in the milk, in the butter, in, in the air. But they are also in the symbolic system because the symbolic system is built up by opposition to what's imagined as Jewish. Yes, so every single, every single icon, every single symbol has its, its uh, reverse. And, and um, this is also how, how the Christian identity was constructed. I mean, it could, it could have been conceived uh, due to the opposition uh, uh, to Judaism. And this is how it comes still work. I mean, and it it works, and it will work endlessly if we don't name the problem and if we don't fight it again against. Because there are real consequences. Yes, I mean, it's a it's a mental structure. It's a, it's a cultural pattern which works like a law of physics. It's not a law of physics, but it will work. Uh, like it. Endlessly, if if it's not uh, clearly, uh, I mean, formulated, addressed, and uh, and thought again. Why don't you speak a little bit about the monuments themselves? The monuments. Um, maybe we, we, we could have a look on the on the just on, on some plans ah, from okay, from sure. the place. 
uh, which are uh, highly charged. They all have their uh, symbolic significance and uh, seeing them there, I mean, is, um, I mean, seeing them there uh, brings us to the, to the, I mean, to the core of the, of the mutually exclusive layers of this is on the on the place where uh, where the gas chambers were. I'm sorry. I you know I'm I'm still before the ident the sole identification because I thought I uh, having identified uh, several of them, but uh, I often I'm not a you know a botanist, so um, it's in the making, if I may. But they are really common plants, you know, they, they meet them everywhere in very tough, tough plants. Um, so as far, maybe, maybe we could, we could um, talk about the monuments at the, at the very end, because we will, we will... Um, sure. I mean, symbolically, yes, they, they incarnate purity, innocence. Uh, uh, very often, also, their meaning is um, is um, referred on the boxes of the herbal tea. Yes, uh, these these ad adverts, I mean, uh, pertain to the benefic uh, skills of these plants. Uh, Yes, they enable digestion, for instance. <laughs> but this is something very, very hard to digest. And, um, or they enable, enable, I mean, facilitate breathing and uh, it's... Sleeping. Sleeping, yes, sleeping. Oh, sleeping, yes, very much. Uh, so these are those, uh, those mushrooms that I can identify, but not, uh, not in English, I, I'm sorry. This is an edible uh, edible mushroom, a delicious one. This one as well. Uh, not very much. <laughs> uh, yes, it's, it's uh, poisonous. Um, this is an edible um, one, and this one as well. So, uh, yes, uh, and I arrived at the matrons. Mm. No, yes. So there, there are models for your work that you found. Yes, and and they are they are uh, they are the authors of the herbaria, which were inspiring uh, for me. Uh, were all women. Uh, so I will quote three of uh, three of them. And uh, they also encouraged me to enlarge my uh, my endeavor to because they were uh, all all these um, all three of them were persuaded that our vision of the nature uh, is too how to say too selective and too mechanical, whereas we should perceive the things in their mutual connections as well. So they are. Uh, Maria Sibylla Marianne, a Dutch or a German uh, botanist from the 18th century, uh, 17th, uh, 17th and, and 18th century. And uh, she was not taken seriously by the professional botanist because uh, she, I mean, joined in her pictures plants uh, and, and insects and also other animals. Which is contrary to the to the I mean to the ideal of uh, of to the un enlightenment ideal of the classification of the classification. Then there is Rosa Luxemburg, the author of a fabulous herbarium with uh, natural plants. And uh, I thought when 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 I when I learned that Rosa Luxemburg. Um, 
I mean, made her volume. I thought that she made it in her young, uh, uh, in, in her youth. There, there may be some people in the audience who don't know who Rosa Luxemburg is. Who is Rosa Luxemburg? Yes. So can, can you introduce uh, Rosa Luxemburg, please? Go, go ahead. Go. Oh, shall I? Shall I? But I think you know. Well, Rosa Luxemburg is uh, one of the most prominent leaders of, uh, of uh, European social democracy. And uh, uh, she also, I mean, was a brilliant, brilliant speaker. Yes, a brilliant speaker and a brilliant writer and also a brilliant scientist. Uh, she's well known for her work um, Accumulatia Capitalu. Anyhow, she she was she worked in the in the wake of uh, Marx, but she deepened his uh, his and uh, admired by Lenin. Admired by Lenin, but very much uh, very much um, I mean conflicted with mm -hmm. with uh, with the Bolsheviks because uh, for uh, Rosa Luxemburg. The revolution should have come from the bottom, and uh, I mean, she was definitely a, a social democrat. Is some, someone also very, uh, very much preoccupied with uh, with the nature? With uh, she was against violence, against the war, and what's worth mentioning is the fact that um, on the eve. Mm -hmm. Of the First World War, German social democrats uh, voted for for the war credits, and uh, I mean, Rosa Luxemburg was not a, a PM uh, uh, person because she was a woman, but uh, only Karl Liebknecht uh, voted against, uh, uh, whereas Rosa Luxemburg was betrayed. And she's the most uh, hatred uh, symbolic figure in Poland uh, because, uh, because she said in one of her papers at the beginning of the 20th century that if Poland regains independence, it will become a racist state of wild capitalism, a clerical racist state of wild capitalist. And uh, yes, uh, so these words remain with us, and and uh, uh, I think that the power uh, of the passion and of the aggression that triggers her name is uh, is due to to the fact that she was um, she was not entirely wrong to be you know to put it mildly so uh, Rosa, and Rosa Luxemburg initially left Poland for studying botanics uh, in Switzerland and so, as well, Marianne as Luxembourg extended their their botanical focus uh, on or at on on, on uh, for instance, geology or uh, as uh, as Marianne did on uh, animals. So I decided to do the same, and this is of course a willow once again from uh, Luxembourg's herbarium. And the, the third, the third author is Alina Shapochnikov, uh, widely exhibited, I think, in, in the United States. There was an exhibit of her, a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, I think, four years ago. A brilliant, brilliant uh, art, artist, a survivor, and I was, uh, I was surprised, if not shocked. Uh, when I realized that uh, she entitled one of the of the of her last works uh, herbarium, and this is a herbarium made out of of the casts of her own body. Um, she died of a, of a cancer, of a breast cancer, and uh, also the other body. Uh, which sort of, sort of model for this work was the one of her son. Mm, and this is actually uh, what my herbarium so is. Uh, it's made out of bodies. Um, so the bestiarium 
part, including animals. Uh, they are very, they were very uh, grateful models. So these are crickets. In uh, butterflies, caterpillar. But there will be also a bee. Yes, a honeybee. <coughs> and the, I mean the visual prints. Uh, Yes, the, the visual principle I, I am following in this work is not to represent the sky. It's always down to earth and oriented towards the, the earth. And this is the only picture uh, in which we can see the sky, the reflection of the sky in the snake's skin. Yes, and we arrive to Oswario. So apart with with bones, with ashes and bones. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, it, it seems to me that part of what what you're showing in all of this is the way that all of these elements circulate. Everything circulates. It circulates in the little animals. It circulates in the moths. It circulates in the plants. The air bears it. The water bears it. Um, and that, and that we, we cannot see Treblinka, we cannot see the disaster of the Holocaust as something that's isolated, as something that is, that, that happened and is no longer part of a living system. And it, it seems to me that this is one of the most powerful elements of your work. Have our plates. It's, yes. um, just a word of, of, uh, of comment, um, you can see uh, the black, black pieces of, of uh, these are bones which were burned, this is why they, they, they and are... these are lying open, plain to view. Mm -hmm. So the people who come and say there is nothing to see, do not see what there is to see. So this is the nothing, and uh, and the white ones. You have also the white ones. Um, uh, here, it's the same principle. And what's what's striking and what's deeply shocking is the difference between human bones, Jewish bones, and the bones of the animals. And you will see the difference in a while. This is this. These are animal bones, and they are entire. I mean, you can you can see them in their entirety, whereas the human bones bones bear. I mean, exemplify uh, the all the aggression they were submitted to. So even after the death. The victims were were objects of, of ultimate aggression. Death was not enough. Yes, this is. Uh, whereas here, yes, that is enough. And um, there was a small animal. I, I have no idea uh, who, who who owned this skull. Yeah. And a lapidarium part. So um, Treblinka is associated with, with stones. It's a, with, it's, a, it's a monument made out, of, made out of stones, but these are also stones which are part of the landscape, uh, which are not considered as, um, as a monument. But, but in, in these stones, we see the impress in a way that we do not in the natural landscape we see the impress of, this, of, of symbolic systems also. Yes, exactly, because these stones come from the direct na neighborhood, uh, uh, namely from Kosovlatsky, uh, where the butter, the extra Polish butter come from, comes from. And so they were carved, these are the gravestones, the Matzevot, 
and uh, they were shattered into pieces and then they served to build up a road connecting uh, the two camps, the German Nazi extermination camp and the German Nazi labor camp, uh, which also namely Jews were, were imprisoned and these are these Jewish inmates who built this road and they received the order of laying down uh, the stones face, face down. Uh, and of, co of course, uh, any subordination was sanctioned with, with, uh, with the death. So it was an act of revolt to lay these stones, this, this um, bits of, of this, this, yes, the scraps of, of, of stones face, face up. And these are several keys with the Hebrew Hebrew alphabet. And I, I, think, I think it's fair to say that your work is the first time this has really been discovered? Uh, not or really. No. This, this was known, but it, as it's not so ext that extraordinary. Mm. It's not extraordinary. You, you, you encounter this kind of, of roads, of pavements, of uh, other, other construction. Uh, there is a Polish photographer, Łukasz Baksik, who um, really, really uh, authored a magnificent album uh, entitled Matzevot of Everyday Use, for Everyday Use. Uh, so the way uh, uh, the Matzevot were used... Uh, no, no, I, I know that there is much evidence of that in, in Lithuania and Poland yeah. and elsewhere. Mm -hmm but that some of these stones were turned face up. Um, no, was, it's was well known. I, 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 I'm not the owner, I uh, think, of that. Okay. You know, but it, it's, it's uh, so common that it was not you know, revealed I as see, uh, something extraordinary. Um, but if I could just interject one thing. Uh, Yehuda Bauer, in his, in his uh, last book, uh, and in several of his books, has talked about the the means, by, the means of Jewish resistance. How could Jews resist when they had no army, they had no organizations, they had, they, they, they had no means at their disposal to resist? And, and, and things like this are helping to dispel the idea that was so common and that has been put forward uh, really uh, by, anti-Semites and, and by Jews alike, that Jews simply were passive, simply went to their death without resistance. And, and we see here a small element of, of how it was possible to at least stand up uh, yes, you know, I would, I would, first of all, I would have never asked this question, we just so often asked, why didn't they resist? Because this is a question, you know, asked by a culture, by a whole axiology and symbolic system which put Jews in this situation and deprived them of any means of defense. And then we ask this question, why didn't they resist? And as, as I mean, with the time, with the time passing away, we um, we are digging. We we research the context, the Polish context of the Holocaust, and we realize how inventive, how creative, how how courageous were Jews who decided to uh, to fight their I mean their enemies against, uh, and their enemies were not only the Germans but. First and foremost, the Poles, they had to deal with every single day. Uh, and uh, frankly, if they, they hadn't been, um, if they hadn't been, if really the local population remained just passive and indifferent, they would have been able to survive in a much bigger number uh, by their own. Because they, because they had the resources, that they knew people, they knew the crime, the whole context, and they were determined, uh, they wanted to fight and they fought. 
but but I mean, so you know, the, the, the whole question is. I, I think we, we we have to protest the very question uh, from the very beginning. But this is this is indeed this is a kind of a of a revolt um, undertaken by, by by those men. We don't know who they were individually. So it's uh, it's really. Um, yes, it's it's moving because it's an anonymous revolt without without the hope that somebody would notice. Uh, yes, so they they expressed they they just what they themselves with the names of the others. And this is how it looks like. There is one name um, which was conserved in its entirety. It ends the lapidarium part. It's Arie. And then the last name uh, that we don't know, but I mean the name is uh, uh, is uh, is in its entirety. So of course they, they 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 were all shot to death um, eventually. So yes, and now these are the stones because those matzevot come uh, from uh, Kosovlatsky, so from from the neighborhood. Uh, whereas the stones which served to build up the monument uh, come from different part of Poland, from Strzegom, Kielce, and so on. And the principle of uh, of commemoration is to you know to mark these stones with engrave them with um, carve them with uh, with the names of the communities where the victims came from. And um, in 2014, I noticed um, this kind of uh, phenomenon um, and another. Another inscription, another name recovered with uh, with a gray paint, gray paint painting. What is this all about? Uh, Yedwabne. Uh, it's a name of a small town, uh, which was not an isolated place neither, because an isolated case. Um, there were several dozens. Of places like Yedwabne, where the Poles uh, executed their Jewish, their Jewish neighbors uh, by themselves uh, in 1941, so before the proper Holocaust started, um, and they executed them. I mean, 100% of, of 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 the Jewish neighbors. These were not the pogroms. Yes, a pogrom is a partial aggression, extremely violent, but it's not a total extermination. So the idea was in, if I may, in the air. This was not owned by, by the Germans alone. And uh, so the Siedwabne. And um, in Poland, uh, for instance, which we all, uh, also often ignore, um, the collapse of the former system in 1989 didn't bring a breakthrough um, the old narratives, the old way of thinking. And the, right, the, the proper Cesura, I mean, the event, the, 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 yes, the event that put an end, we, we hoped that it would put an end to the old way of thinking was the two 2000 publication of uh, Jan Tomasz Gross book uh, about Jedwabne uh, neighbors, uh, followed by a na nationwide debate. So this is why this name was not erased, but I mean covered with with uh, with the great great paint painting. The Jedwabne Jews didn't perish in. Treblinka. So it's that Polish crime was ascribed to the Germans. 
And so it didn't, uh, I mean, it didn't uh, surprise me. I thought it was the right way. I was only surprised that uh, the inscription was not, you know, just removed. Uh, but I, I, got, uh, I got surprised uh, a few years later while seeing this inscription uh, carefully restored. And this is, of course, this occurred after the authoritarian turn uh, which took place in 2015. Uh, and one of the first things made by the new authorities was to declare that uh, the Yedvabne massacre was per perpetrated by the Germans. So let me uh, just uh, jump in for one second. Uh, Evo leads tours to uh, Poland and Lithuania, study tours we call them. And uh, generally it's 20, 22, 23 people who come with us and, and Treblinka is a stop uh, that, we, that we make. And, and these are, are people, some of them are knowledgeable, some of them want to learn, uh, some of them have no knowledge at all. And they come to Treblinka and they see Yedvab, the name Yedvabne on that stone. And they haven't necessarily read Jan Tomasz Gross's book. And so what did they come away with? They come away with the idea that the Jews of Yedvabne perished in Treblinka. So this, this, is, this, is, this is like advertising. Yes, this is a... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Advertising. An iconic message. A, mm -hmm. a, a very dangerous mistruth. But isn't, it, it doesn't have a double meaning because it may work the opposite way around. Uh, you know how Poles are uh, allergic to, uh, to the idea of um, acknowledging their co-participation into the Holocaust. And here, it's as if they wanted really to inscribe, you know, to subscribe to, to the German endeavor, saying, uh, we, we, we as well, uh, count us in. <laughs> and so, so I, I have always, you know, a double, double feeling about this, this, this horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Um, and this is not the only stone. stone. I mean, the, the, the Gonions one was also re renovated, and um, and uh, yes, Gonions is uh, uh, is situated in the neighborhood of of uh, Treblinka. Yes. Yes. And then, surprise, surprise! Uh, while finishing my my text, I. Uh, I thought to myself it would be worth to just to see how looked uh, um, how looks like uh, the first Polish herbarium uh, dating back to to the 16th century, uh, the first Polish language herbarium uh, elaborated by um, by a doctor by by, by a f physician. Um, from Krakow, I mean, uh, having having studied in Krakow and also in Italy, and uh, a very eminent humanist, uh, it's a beautiful piece of work. Uh, it's a five-volume herbarium, uh, which is uh, which even may still be used. It's so pre I mean, precise and and really were well, well done. A beautiful a beautiful piece of work as well. Um, and so I come across the herbarium, and uh, of course I'm, I couldn't be more moved because the, the Polish, the ancient Polish, is so beautiful. The pictures are beautiful. I'm uh, I'm moved by the fact that also Sireniusz, uh, I mean, joined you know um, juxtaposed animals and insects and plants in his in his pictures. And then I encounter in one of the volumes 
four pages entitled O Żydziech Rzecz Krótka, A Short Piece About Jews. It's a short piece, but everything is in it. Uh, it's uh, mainly uh, around the, the narrative of the ritual murder, um, allegedly reproducing the structure of the crucifixion, and so it's a kind of a warning to the, to the readers. Uh, so these are four pages of hate speech. Um, Yes, and I have no idea. I I I didn't find an answer to my question. What I mean, relevance. Even even if Serenius was an anti-Semite, there was he was no choice uh, to to be honest. But but why to put uh, it so strict so strictly done? His classifications are so so strict and and pure, if I may. Why why to put this this uh, short piece about Jews in a herbarium? And it's I you know I felt like if like if the time compressed and uh, before 16th century for me was really a long 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 time ago no it was yesterday if not this morning and uh, and and maybe Serenius didn't know why he put this short piece about Jews in his herbarium, but we got an answer. And uh, I mean, my herbarium doesn't need, you know, an extra, an external part about Jews. It's all not, it's all about Jews, but also made out of Jews. And this is the, the conclusion of this. I mean, we can see like this way of thinking uh, worked really worked and produced a, a physical reality uh, we live in. This is the end of the treatise with a beautiful, beautiful um, ornament. And, and this is my last visual word. <laughs> So it was a close call from afar. I mean, finding this, this, this. So. Yes. Don't you think that he put the Jews in there because he felt very much like the cultural anthropologist, <laughs> that they don't fit. The Jews, the Jews really don't fit into the herbarium. Uh, okay, so. He, you, you, you mean the, he, he needed of the odd, <laughs> the odd thing of, of a small yeah. ghetto in yes. his, uh, yes. in his, I, I, frankly, I wonder, th there is one more thing uh, which, w of course, it's a, it's a chance, yes, it's, it, it's, it couldn't have been intended, because how, but Serenius is, um, where, where was he born? Uh, and where where is situated the place where where he's really his memory is cultivated and, and uh, uh, he was born in a city uh, not far from Krakow called Schwinchim in in Yiddish Auschwitz in, in German Auschwitz. So, <laughs> of course, it's not you know uh, it would be an over interpretation. Uh, to to conclude upon uh, such premises, but but uh, anyhow, it it comes all together, and it forms a, an yes a, cohe a, co a coherent entirety, a frightening one. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience.